What's up guys, welcome to this R session. So today I'm going to be introducing you to the tree and R part packages in R. Uh, we're going to be discussing some basic syntax for fitting tree based models in R. I'm going to be showing you how to play around with the uh, stopping criteria for the uh, partitioning algorithm. And I'm also going to be showing you how to draw response curves um, for tree based models, um, which will be important for interpreting tree based models along with the plots of the trees, of course. Um, if there's anything we want to do before we start is maybe just have a quick look at the help documentation in R. Just type question mark and then put package name over there. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to check that as we go. In any case, let's jump in. Right, as usual with our lab sessions, uh, we've got one overarching goal. Um, today's first example, the goal is to simulate a nonlinear uh, regression pattern apply the partitioning algorithm to the pattern for various stopping criteria, and then draw response curves to demonstrate model complexity. Okay, uh, as usual, I've also um, divided this up into what's four tasks. The first task is to simulate and plot the sinusoidal pattern with noise. Uh, task two is to call the tree library and fit a regression tree to the data. Um, task three is to draw a response curve to demonstrate the predicted pattern under the regression tree model. And then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to modify the stopping criteria for the partitioning algorithm and redraw the response curve to see what the effect is. Okay, so um, let's get to it. Um, simulate and plot a simple sinusoidal pattern with noise. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set a seed. Um, what this will do is uh, this will fix the random numbers that is generated for our example. Okay, and we're going to I don't know, simulate 250 observations for this run, okay? Um, and because we're not sort of interested in any particular problem, we're just sort of interested in demonstrating how the software works, uh, I'm just going to have some arbitrary uh, predictor, let's call it X. Um, we're going to say that that is a random uniformly distributed on minus 1 to 1. Okay, and I said we're going to have to simulate a sinusoidal pattern, so a sinusoidal relationship between the predictor and the response. Okay, so we need to create a response, and then also I said we need to add noise. Okay, so let's create some noise terms. I'm just going to call that E. Um, let's make them normally distributed. E for error, 0, and we're going to make the standard deviation 0.25. Okay. And then we're going to simulate our response. So y is going to be a function sine 2 times pi times x uh, plus some error term. Okay, cool. So that's going to um, simulate a predictor and then also a response. And we're going to have 250 of those. And then maybe let's plot the data to see what that looks like. Okay, so we're going to plot. Remember the response y as a function of the predictor x. Okay, we're gonna make the plotting character, plotting character number 16, so that it's a solid circle. And we're gonna make the color magenta. Okay, now when I run this, it's gonna plot, it's gonna try and draw a nice plot just as a reminder from, I guess, previous lab sessions in the Poisson process section, uh, this par function that I'm calling here. Uh, I'm just changing the default sort of backgrounds for the plotting region and so on. Um, so that I don't blind you guys. Strictly speaking, you don't have to do this, so don't worry about that. And then rm list equals ls just flushes the workspace so that there's nothing in the way. Okay, so let's run this and see what our data looks like. Okay, cool. Indeed, we have our sinusoidal pattern. So the sign bit is given by that sine 2 pi x and then the sort of noise around that is given by the plus e there we have normally distributed terms okay so we know how the generate the data is generated we know what the underlying pattern is um, that's not even a consequence we're just interested in seeing how the um, the partitioning algorithm works and how to use the tree library we'll look at some real data later okay so that puts us at task two Call the tree library and fit a regression tree to the data. So remember, this is a regression problem. Why? Because our response is on a continuous scale. So let's call the tree library, library tree 
Okay, and then we're going to fit a tree based model to that. So how are we going to do that? Well, to do that, we're going to need to look at the tree function. Okay, so let's I'm going to rerun everything. Um, go to the help file for the tree function. And uh, let's see. So, fit a classification or regression tree. A tree is grown by binary recursive partitioning using the response in a specified formula and choosing splits from the terms on the right hand side. Okay, so we see that the usage, we call the tree function. We need to give it a formula then, uh, which says how the, the uh, predictors and the response is related, data, um, some other parameters. And yeah, okay, so let's look at the main sort of arguments for the function. First argument, formula. So a formula expression, uh, the left-hand side, which is supposed to be the response, should be either a numerical vector, when a regression tree will be fitted. Okay, so we know we, we created a numerical vector, so that'll be fine. Um, we can just pass that to the tree function. Tree will be fitted, or a factor when a classification tree is produced. So whenever we want to do a classification problem, we just need to make sure that the response is uh, um, encoded as a factor. Okay, so the right-hand side should be a series of numeric or factor variables separated by plus. Uh, this sh there should be no interaction terms. Okay, both dot and hyphen are allowed. Okay, yeah, so that's just from the formula notation. Uh, we'll speak a bit about that a bit later. Uh, data, so a data frame which could uh, preferentially interpret formula. Okay, so all the terms in your formula should be in a data frame that you pass to it. It's not strictly speaking necessary. Um, if the variables are in the workspace, you don't need to pass a data frame, but usually it's good practice to, you know, keep the data in a data frame, pass the data frame so that you don't confuse things. Uh, weights, subsets, I'm just going to ignore those for now. Welcome to read them. The other important one we need to look at is control. Okay, so control is a list returned by tree.control. Okay, so let's have a quick look at tree.control. So you can scroll down to tree.control. And what is tree.control? Select parameters for a tree. So this is a utility function for use with the control argument of tree. And you can see that, okay, tree.control, this function, it's got a number of parameters, so in obs, so the number of observations in the training set, min cut, the minimum number of observations to include in either child node, min size, the smaller to loud node size, and then min dev. The width in node deviance must be at least this times that of the root node for the node to be split. Okay, so what is tree.control? Tree.control are the control parameters for um, our uh, partitioning algorithm. Okay, so this is essentially the stopping criterion. So as the algorithm is partitioning, it's always checking these criteria. It's making sure that there's a minimum of, what's it, five number of observations to include in each child node. It's making sure that each um, node has at least 10 observations. And then in order, to act, um, in order to actually split something, it must be at least 0 0.01 uh, under the default um, of the within node deviance before it actually splits. Okay, so that's just so you know what, what that's about. So how do we then use the tree function? Okay, so we go, I don't know, take an object. We're going to call it res for result again. Tree, and we're going to model y, the response we created as a function of what? Of the input x. Okay, and we're just going to fit a tree-based model. Uh, I'm not going to pass a data frame to that because these variables are already in um, in the workspace. And what this is now going to do is this is going to be apply uh, the partitioning algorithm to this data and fit a regression tree. Okay, so let's run all of that. Cool. So res is now an object. Uh, we can look at that. Let's see what does res do. Okay, so. In res, we can see that there's a tree, and now what does it return? Well, it explains the splits um, that it created. Okay, so first it tells you what sort of node of the tree it is, um, where the split occurred, how many observations there were in that partition before it split, the deviance of each split, y val, that's just going to be the predictor, and then it says star denotes a terminal node. Okay, so essentially, just giving you an idea of what the tree is, a tree looks like. Okay, so we'll come back to this later. Cool, but obviously, um, tree-based model, it's easier to interpret if you can plot it. So 
nice thing we can do with tree library is just go plot res. So it's going to plot that object. Okay, so it creates a nice tree for us. And then we just need to fill in the details for the tree. And the way we do that is by text res. So we pass that object to the function text. And that then adds um, details to the tree. Okay, and what does the tree do? Okay, there you can see it's taking this one predictor we have and it says, okay, if that predictor is less than minus 0.54, uh, you know, go to the left. Um, if that then is less than minus 0.9, um, predict 0.1. If it's greater than that, predict 0.8. Okay, right. And then we go back to the top of the tree, say that um, if it's greater than minus 0.54, whatever, go to the right. Then if it's less than, okay. So we sort of see the tree argument um, going. And I guess we know what the pattern looks like. So I guess rather unsurprisingly, uh, if you look at the terminal nodes and you look at the predicted values, you sort of see an oscillating pattern, right? So it goes 0 0.1, 0 0.8, minus 0.2, minus 0.8, minus 0.2, then 0 0.2, 0 0.81, um, minus 0 0.068, minus 0.91, minus 0.26. Okay, um, now in any case, and this is a sort of silly example, so maybe the tree itself is not useful for inter interpretation. So yeah, let's let's come back to that at a later stage. I guess I'm just going to copy and um, com comment that out, and let's go to task three. Okay, so task three says draw a response curve to demonstrate the predicted pattern under the regression tree model. Okay, so what is a response curve? Okay, the idea behind the response curve is simple. Okay, once we've fitted a model, okay, uh, we then want to know what is the relationship predicted by the model between the predictor and the response. Okay, so one way we can try and figure out what that pattern is, is to go into the feature space and say, okay, let's create some regularly spaced coordinates in the feature space, and then let's evaluate a prediction for each one of those coordinates in the feature space. Okay, then our model will give us a prediction for each one of those. And because we've ordered our um, coordinates in that, um, in that feature space in, you know, in, in some understandable pattern, um, then we can get an idea of the relationship between the predictor and the response. Okay, so how do we draw a response curve? Well, fortunately in this case, it's easy because, well, we've just got one predictor. Okay, so what we can do, um, is we're going to create a lattice in one dimension. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, well, we're going to create 100 coordinates along the x dimension. Okay, so we're going to create a x dummy variable. Okay, and we're going to create a sequence, right, running from the minimum observed um, input to its maximum. And we're going to make it of length equals uh, m. Whatever we set m to, we set it equal to 100. Okay, so that's going to create a sort of dummy vector. And then that's going to give us some coordinates in the feature space, x, where we're going to evaluate our prediction. So, um, cool. Right, now we need to evaluate predictions for that. Um, so how do we do that? Well, in order to predict uh, from the fitted tree object, we're going to use the predict function. Okay, so let's just type question mark predict and have a quick look at that. So it says predict, then you pass an object to it, and then there's going to be some other parameters. So let's look at predict uh, dot tree. Might be more useful. Okay, yeah, so that tells us the specifics of predicting for a tree object. Okay, so predict and an object, so fitted model of object class tree. Okay, so that's where we're going to pass our tree, our fitted tree model. And then we have to give it new data in the form of a list. So a data frame containing the values at which the predictions are required. Okay, um, and then there are some other parameters. So type, what type of prediction do you want? So a character string denoting whether the predictions are returned as a vector or as a tree object. Okay, split and then yeah. Okay, so there's some other parameters as well to check out. In any case, 
let's use the predict function. Okay, well, first thing we need to do is actually create the lattice. Um, so let's call it uh, lattice. And that's going to be a data frame. Okay, where we say that x in this data frame, for which we're going to create the predictions, uh, must take on the values in the dummy sequence. Okay. Okay, now uh, just one note here, be careful. Um, in this data frame, right, this object which we assign, uh, take this dummy vector, we assign it to this object x, this thing must have the same name uh, as the variables used in our model. Otherwise, um, it's not going to know what to do with it. Okay. Right, so once we have set up that data frame, what we want to do is we want to evaluate a prediction. So I'm just going to call that uh, pred y for short and we're going to call predict and we're going to pass uh, our fitted model to that res okay and where do we want it to predict well at the points in the lattice remember that's in our data frame and that that's going to draw the predictions um, okay and that's going to be our predictions we still want to draw a response curve to demonstrate the predicted pattern under the regression tree model okay so I'm just going to borrow this again, the plot. Okay, so we're going to plot the data and then we're going to superimpose uh, our predictions. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to call the lines function. Why can we call lines? Um, well, it's because these x's are nice and ordered, so it'll produce predictions which are in sequence, and we're going to be able to interpret the pattern. Okay, cool. So prediction y and that'll be a function of the dummy vector okay alternatively what you could do is you could read it off of the lattice so lat e dollar x it's another way you could do that um, and we're going to go line width equals three um, just so it stands out and yeah okay so let's leave it at other okay so let's run all of this see what our pattern looks like okay cool so we've got our data, uh, we've now fitted our tree-based model, and what do we see? Okay, so our tree-based model, right, is partitioning along, along the x-axis, so our input uh, variable, or feature space, if you will, um, and it's creating these partitions in such a way, such that the predictions match what the response is, and it's also giving this sort of sinusoidal um, curve, albeit, you know, a square wave, if you want to call it that. Okay. So that's just under the defaults, right? So we can see that our tree-based model is pretty good at recreating a non-linear pattern. I mean, it's not very smooth, uh, but nevertheless, maybe it's maybe it's good for prediction or at least a good start. Okay, and we've drawn a response curve. Um, so what do we want to do next? Okay, well, let's modify the stopping criteria for the partitioning algorithm and then redraw the response curve. Um, okay, I guess for each, each, each variation. Okay, so why would we want to do that? Well, remember that with the partitioning algorithm, so I'm calling it a tree model here, but uh, fundamentally this is a bit more abstract, right? We've got this partitioning algorithm running and sort of the tree we end up with is dependent on the stopping criteria that we apply. Remember how is it going to split? Well, it's looking at the deviance, it's saying that the change in deviance must be above a certain level, otherwise it won't split all that jazz. Okay, so the pattern we get out is dependent on the um, stopping criteria. Okay, so let's modify the stopping criterion a bit uh, uh, and see what happens. Now, if you remember from the tree function, uh, how did we modify that? Um, well, we wanted to have control equals Three dot control. Okay, and then we had to pass a couple of things. So we had to say tree dot control. In obs was the number of observations in the training set. So that's just going to be n here. Um, min cut. It's going to be five. Min size ten. We're going to leave those to the same for now. And then min dev. So that was the sort of threshold parameter for splitting. Okay, so let's modify that one first. Okay, so tree dot control. Uh, we're going to make n in min cut 5, min size 10, and we're going to make min dev instead of 0 0.01, which is the default, as you can see there, we're going to make that point, 
uh, let's make it 0 0.1. Let's make it large. Okay, and see what the effect is. Okay, so let's rerun. Ooh, all of the analysis. What happened? Oh, yeah. There you go. Idiot. Okay. Indeed, what do we get? We get a simpler pattern out. Why did we get a simpler pattern out? Okay, so we get this sinusoidal shape, but it was simpler than it was before, right? So just do, let's have a, just a quick revisit of what it looked like before. Okay, and then after we change it to a larger value for Mindev, okay, simpler square wave pattern. Why does that happen? Well, we've increased the threshold by which the deviance must change for it to affect the split. So what does that mean for the partitioning algorithm? Every time it partitions, we've set the threshold a bit higher, so Okay, it's less likely actually to affect a split. Okay, now what does that mean for fitting the data? Well, okay, this, this wave is then a poorer approximation, I guess, of the underlying pattern. If you remember, we know what the underlying pattern is. So I guess it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But in any case, we can at least see, um, you know, where the mismatch occurs. Okay, so maybe we're not happy with that. Okay, so the default was 0 0.01. I don't know, let's make it smaller. So 0 0.001. Okay, what do you think the effect is going to be? Okay, so let's rerun the analysis. Sure, okay. So we get a much closer fit to the data, but obviously a much more complex um, pattern. Okay, so you can see what the effect is of uh, changing uh, the MinDev parameter. Why? It's sort of changing the threshold, uh, which needs to be exceeded um, in order for it to affect a split. Okay, so um, maybe as a way to demonstrate that, uh, in a cool way, what we can do is we're going to create a sequence, I guess, of um, MinDev parameters over which we're going to rerun the algorithm and we're going to see it create that more complex um, pattern. Okay, so let's do dev sequence. Uh, we're going to create a sequence running from... Let's make it... 0.5 to 0.001. Okay, and we're going to say length equals 100. Okay, so then we're going to go run a for loop for i running from 1 to 100. Okay, we're going to rerun this whole exercise um, for each of the Mindev values in this sequence. Okay, so we're going to go res, and we're going to borrow this, but fit a model, and then we're going to rerun the prediction bit. So draw the response curve again. Okay, and what is the thing that we're going to change? Uh, well, the mindev parameter. So I'm just going to make it explicit. Here. So mindev equals whatever the ith element in this sequence is. Okay, and this is going to run quick. Um, so maybe what we want to do is we're going to go Windows, call up window. Um, I'm just going to call these parameters again. I'm going to need that. Okay, so it's just going to set the background colors, everything correctly again for this window that's going to pop up and it's going to draw this tree model, or I guess this response curve um, for each of those cases. Uh, and we just want to maybe stop it for a short... Oh, we'll just give it a short pause between each plot so that we can actually see it draw that plot. Okay, so let's, let's run all of this. Let's see if it works. And indeed, what can you see? Um, okay, well, what are we doing? We're running backwards from a large value to a small value. So what's happening as we're decreasing that um, threshold parameter, we get a more and more complex pattern. Okay, so let's maybe make it more obvious. Um, I'm just going to overlay. So let's go main equals paste zero. And we're going to call it um, dev equals um, um, dev sequence i. So 
I'm just going to plot or, or change the plot title according to what the Mendev value is. Okay, so let's just sort of close this up again and rerun it. What do we see? Okay, so as that value is becoming smaller and smaller, you get a more complex pattern. Okay, until eventually when we're at a very small value, um, sort of almost passing through the data. Okay, cool. So um, let's maybe close that one for now. Okay, leave it as is. And then let's play around with some of the other parameters. Okay, um, so let's take bit out okay let's make uh, mendev equals point zero zero let's make it point zero one maybe okay and then let's change some of the other parameters okay so let's just have a look at what that looks like first okay so okay so that was what we had before let's see what happens when you change the other stopping criterion um, so let's make these one, two, so that it ends up with, it only requires two nodes in each terminal node. Okay, so what do we expect to happen with that? Uh, maybe we expect a more complex tree. Okay, so that doesn't seem to change anything. Um, so let's go back. Um, let's make this smaller. Uh, let's run that. Okay, let's see if it changes the picture. If we go one to two. Okay, so if we require fewer elements in the terminal leaf nodes, then I guess that corresponds um, to less stringent stopping criterion. So we should expect a more complex model. Okay, yeah, and we get a slightly different model out there. Oh, it's sort of jumping to this one observation here. That's interesting. Wonder what happened. Yeah. I mean, let's maybe change it up. Okay, so we had five. So let's make this 10 and this 20. So this is supposed to produce a simpler pattern. Yes, and indeed we can see that that happens. So let's make that 40 and 20. Okay. And indeed. Right, so we can see what the effect is of the control parameters. Uh, on our response curve and necessarily what the effect is on the partitioning algorithm and how that relates to the complexity of our underlying model. Okay, so I guess the main takeaway here is that that MINDEV parameter, which is the um, splitting criterion, I guess, if you like, um, is sort of the most important bit of that partitioning algorithm. Right, guys, so uh, welcome back. Uh, for our second example today, we're going to be a bit less hand wavy about the actual interpretation of the tree plot. Um, as usual, we've got one overarching goal, and that is to use the tree-based model to analyze the iris data in our plot for the trees and interpret. Um, and then we're going to fit and draw a response curve for the petal inputs. So these inputs pertain to the data, as you'll see, and then superimpose the observations on the response curve. Okay, and then I've broken it up into uh, three little tasks, uh, two tasks pertaining to plotting and interpreting the tree, um, and then one uh, for drawing a response curve. And as you'll see, I'll be introducing you to a, another library for uh, doing tree-based model analysis in R. Okay, so let's get to it. Uh, first task is load the iris data and fit a tree-based model to the data. Plot and interpret the tree. Okay, so let's load in the data. So as it happens, this data set is already part of the R, uh, R data sets package. So you can use the data function to call it into the workspace. Then we're gonna go attach iris. So what does attach do? It says uh, attach the variable names in this data frame uh, such that it is uh, that these variable, the variables in that data frame appear in the workspace. So you don't actually have, if you have to go you know, iris dollar, and then give the uh, the variable name. You can just call the variable names as though they are in the workspace. Attach, and then let's go 
head iris. Uh, let's look at the first 10 lines. Okay, so let's rerun the analysis. Um, okay, and what do we see? Okay, it's called in some data set. We've got variables, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. Okay, so it's a bit of out of context, uh, but we've pulled in the data. Now, it's nice about this is because it is a data set in R, we can have a look at the description of the data just by writing question mark iris. Okay, so let's do that. And what do we see? Okay, so this is Edgar Anderson's iris data. So then this description is this famous Fisher or Anderson's iris data, I guess it's known as either Fisher or Anderson's data set, uh, gives the measurements in centimeters of the variables sepal length and width and petal length and width respectively for 50 flowers from each of three species of iris. The species are iris setosa, versicolor, and virginica. Okay, so we've got 150 observations, uh, 50 uh, from each one of three species. Okay, now this is a famous data set because um, it's been analyzed by none other than R.A. Fisher. If you don't know who that is, go look it up. Very important statistician. Uh, and yeah, indeed, you can you can find a link uh, to this paper. Well, I guess I'll link below to um, some resources on this paper uh, from 1936 on the use of multiple measurements in taxonomic problems. Again, that sort of covers this data set exactly. Okay, cool. Um, now, if like me, uh, you do not know what the difference is between a sepal and a petal, um, I'll maybe include a little clip here trying to explain what that is. Right, guys, so as promised, um, if you do not know what the difference is between petals and sepals, you have got an example of a flower. Uh, this is not an iris. This is just a flower I've borrowed from my better half uh, in our living room. And as you can see, you've got the flower there, which is usually made up of petals. So petals are these little leaves you've got here. Right, so let me see if I can pull one off. Ooh, there you go. There's a petal. Okay, so I guess what they did for this data set is for those iris species, uh, they measured the length and the width of the petals. Okay, now as for where the sepals are, if you take the flower and you turn it upside down, these little green leaves that you see over here, these are the sepals. Okay, now they need not be green, uh, they can be similar, colored similarly to the petals um, for some species. And indeed, with the iris species, um, you, know, you can just type it into Google and you'll see uh, that they do look quite similar to the petals. Cool. So, task one, loading the data for the tree-based model and plot and interpret. Okay, so I've already called in the tree library. Um, we want to go create an object, res1. We want to fit a tree model, so we call the function tree. And then we're going to give it a formula. So what is our formula going to be? Well, uh, we're interested in predicting species. Um, so the spronz is species. So we're modeling species as a function of. So in place of as function of, we write tilde in R. And then I'm going to write a little dot. Okay, so what does that dot do? Well, in R, what you can do to specify a formula is I can go species, uh, model species as a function of, and then write individually each one of these variables. So go sepal length plus sepal width plus petal length plus petal width. If I'm not interested in doing that, because I know a priori I'm going to be using all of the variables, what I can just do is model species as a function of dot, and then what that will do is that will tell the function to go and look in the supplied data frame. So it's important you have to supply the data frame, otherwise it's not going to do with, know what to do with the dot. Um, so we apply it, supply the data frame called iris, and what that's going to do is it's going to say, okay, uh, model species as a function of everything else, right? So go in this data frame, look at everything that is not species, and model species as a function of it. Cool. So for the tree-based model, we want to model it as a function of all of the inputs for now, um, and then we want to set some control parameters. Okay, so I'm just going to set now the control parameters to... I don't know, or uh, let's go tree.control. What were the control parameters? Well, it's the number of observations. So we're going to go length, species, 
um, let's get that right. Um, and then let's just have a look at what the parameters were. Remember them off by heart. Control, so min cut, default is five, min size, the default's 10. Okay, so these are all for the stopping criterion. Uh, I'm just gonna be using the defaults for now, and then let's set min dev equals to, I guess, the default for now. Let's just run with the defaults. I guess you could have left this, but it's nice to see the control parameters there uh, when we discuss uh, the uh, tree plots. Okay, so let's run the analysis. That's gonna fit a tree-based model, and then let's plot the trees. Cool, so we fitted a tree. Next we wanna do is we wanna plot the tree. Okay, so what we can do in R, we can just call the generic plot function. If we supply an object of class tree to plot function, there will be some plot routine for that. So we've done that. We've uh, used the tree function here that returns an object of class tree. So it'll know what to do with that. Um, running plot, that creates a nice tree structure. And then we wanna go fill in the details in that tree by using the text function. Okay, so text, res1, add that details to the tree. Okay, and that gives us our tree plot. Okay, so as always, the goal of the analysis is to find the relationship between uh, the predictors and the response. The predictors in this case is gonna be sepal length and width and petal length and width, and we wanna predict uh, species, right? So which is the response? Okay, so our tree plot is going to tell us something about the relationship between the predictors and the response. Specifically, what is most predictive of the response? Okay, and our tree plot, how it does that is by, I guess, capturing a little snapshot of how the partitioning algorithm run. Okay, and there's a lot of information there about one, just the algorithm itself, uh, but then also it preserves information about the relationship between the predictors and the response. Okay, and how does it do that? Well, if you think about the algorithm and what it's doing, um, it's saying, okay, let's go first, um, you know, group all the data, it's in one big region. Uh, we wanna say, okay, we've got a simple partitioning rule, um, partition the data along each of the variables that you have, okay? Uh, look at partitions which improve some objective function, Okay, so if our jet, in, in a regression problem, that's gonna be RSS. Uh, in a classification problem, that can be like deviance or Gini, Gini index or, or some, some pro appropriate classification um, objective function. And if you find such an improvement along any of those variables, look at the one which is best and split along that dimension. Okay, so that's gonna partition a feature space um, improve the objective, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna rerun the analysis on each one of those subregions. Okay, now obviously this process can continue on forever unless we have some stopping criteria. But remember, we have some stopping criteria and built in. We said that there has to be a minimum number of observations in each subregion. Um, any split has to result in improvement factor of 0.01 of the original deviance or whatever the objective was, something like that. Okay. So uh, if you look along the um, sort of length of our plot, that sort of captures information about the trajectory of this algorithm as it's running, right? Because it says, okay, uh, it looked at all the variables and at the first split, okay, it found that petal length improved the objective the most. And indeed it improves the sort of, well, it gives you an, an some idea of the relative improvement by the length of the branches of that tree. Okay, so you can see petal length, Okay, big improvement in the objective from just predicting as the mean. So surely there must be some pattern um, in the predictors uh, giving some information about the response. Okay, so indeed, if you go and look at petal length, um, if you look at petal lengths lower than 2.45, uh, you'll find that those, uh, th those are associated with the species Setosa. If you look at petal lengths greater than 2.45, um, those are associated with species Versicolor and Virginica. Okay, so you already have some information um, about the relationship between the predictors and the responses. Okay, but now if we can think of put our algorithm hats on. Okay, uh, after we apply this first split, we go to our first subregion, we apply the algorithm again, and then we see, well, okay, 
at least one of the stopping criterion is satisfied. So either it didn't improve fit to apply the algorithm again in that subregion, uh, or there weren't enough observations in that region, etc. One of the stopping criterion was satisfied, so stop. Look at the re relative frequency of the responses in that area, and that gives you that prediction. So for that area, in this case, that'll be Satos. Okay, in the other sub, in the other um, subregion that was created, um, it said, okay, well, we can apply the algorithm again, look at all the variables, uh, find some partitioning point, uh, which one partitioned it best? Well, it found that along petal width, um, that created another partition, sort of giving another idea of the relative improvement in fit by the length of those branches branching out from this node, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what is this telling us? It's saying, okay, again, we have some information about the trajectory of the algorithm, but now we're two splits in. Okay, we've seen a significant improvement in the objective. Um, where are the splits? It's on petal length and petal width. Okay, so what does that tell you about those predictors? Well, those predictors are useful for predicting the response. What are the responses? It's, again, it's a species, so petal length, if we're looking at short petal lengths, those are associated with the species Setosa. Um, for longer petal lengths, they're associated with Versicella and Virginica. But then look at petal width, and then you'll see that it's mostly associated, or short pet petal widths uh, are associated with Versicella, whereas longer petal widths are associated with the species Virginica. Okay, and then you can obviously go on and on as the algorithm goes, and you see that the relative improvement in the objective becomes smaller and smaller, and then eventually the stopping criterion is satisfied. Okay, so you can see how these sort of uh, decision statements, these logical statements, preserve some structure in the feature space, which you can then interpret at the hand of this tree. Okay, cool. So that's a tree plot using the tree package. What we can do now is now we're going to look at another package, which I like a bit more for drawing tree plots. Okay, but we're just going to repeat the analysis. The package we're going to be using is the R part and R part dot plot libraries. Okay, so this is for task two. We're going to rerun the analysis using those libraries, play around with the plot parameters to draw more readable tree. Okay, so why do we, we want to have more readable trees? Okay, so now this is a very simple data set. Okay, you can see we've got a nice and simple tree structure, which is easy to interpret. We've only got the four variables to really look at, um, so not too difficult to interpret. And there's no overplotting here with names crossing over, whatever. Now, if you've got lots of data, specifically if you've got lots of variables in your data, and the underlying pattern is maybe complex, you'll see that these tree structures become quite complicated and then difficult to actually see what's going on in the tree. Okay, so if you want a bit more control about what's going on in your tree plot, you can use the R part and R part dot plot libraries. Okay, so let's just rerun everything. We're going to call library R part R part dot plot, and then we're going to look at some of the functions. Okay, now what you can do is, well, first you're going to have to fit a tree model again to this data, and the way you're going to do that is uh, with the R part function. So let's look at question mark R part, and then what do we see? So R part is the recursive partitioning and regression trees. Okay, sort of familiar nomenclature. And its usage is R part, and then you need to supply it with some arguments. The first argument is formula, so a formula with the response, but no interaction terms. Um, data, again, you're gonna give it data frame. We've got weights, a bunch of other parameters, and then eventually have control, right? Okay, so a lot of this is looking familiar, right? And indeed, let's have a quick look at the tree function, and you'll see that, okay, a lot of the arguments are actually the same. Now, that's no coincidence. As it happens, the author of the tree library is also one of the authors of the R part library. Okay, so now I gather from what I can see in the literature that that's sort of the R part library came along a bit later, um, but it's, you know, at least one of the authors of the R part library is the same as the original author of the tree library, one Brian Ripley, another name in statistics that you might uh, find worthwhile looking up. Okay, but in any case, um, this being a later package, I guess, uh, it provides more control uh, for plotting things, and I like this library 
a lot more, not only for plotting things, um, but also for the validation analysis, which is the subject of uh, later videos. Okay, so let's fit a model. Um, I'm just gonna create a new object, uh, res2, and we're gonna use the R part function to now model data um, now, as it happens, because these sort of inputs are the same, uh, we can just model again species as a function of all of the inputs, pass the iris data frame, and then the only thing we need to check now is uh, how to set the control parameters for our partitioning algorithm. Okay, so again, we're going to go control, and then let's look at the um, control. So what do we need to supply to control? A list of options that control details of the R part algorithm, see R part dot control. Okay, so let's go to R part dot control. Excellent, so this is similar again to the tree function and we can see a bunch of arguments that we need to pass to this. Okay, so min split, so that is the minimum number of observations that must exist in a node in order for it to be, for a split to be attempted. Min bucket, uh, the minimum number of observations in any terminal leaf node, so after a split has occurred. And we can see that that's the sort of rounded value of min split divided by three. Cool, then CP, which is a complexity parameter. Any split that does not decrease the overall lack of fit by a factor of CP is not attempted. Okay, so this is again the threshold parameter which needs to be sort of exceeded for an, a split to be effective. Okay, so very much the same story as we had before. Um, I guess we can just set the defaults for now, or I guess use the defaults now. The only thing I'm gonna be setting is the complexity parameter, because that's gonna show up later. I'll just set it to the default, that's fine. Um, but yeah, but note here that the sort of min split and min bucket, I guess, these defaults are slightly different to tree. So I guess we can expect to see a different Based function. In any case, it's probably using a different objective function, slightly different objective function. Okay, so those are the important parameters for um, this part of the analysis, or I guess this data set for now. Um, next, what we want to do is uh, plot, right? So, how do we plot a tree based model? Okay, so I guess let's just run the analysis first. Okay, so see that we've res2 has now got an object of class r part and we want to plot a r part tree okay so the way we're going to do that is using the r part dot plot library so this is an entire separate library just for plotting uh, tree based objects from r part which is nice because there's lots of nice documentation about how it works and um, it's captured very nicely okay um so how are we going to draw plots? We're going to use the rpart.plot function. Um, we're going to pass the rpart class object to that, which we stored in res2. Um, and I'm just going to set the defaults for now. Okay, so draw a plot of that. Cool. And what can you see? Already a much better looking tree, right? Why is it better looking? Well, it's nice and colored. Um, you know, it's, it's it's got labels, everything. Um, you've got your sort of decision statements that you need to make, but it's actually more clear about which direction the truth of that statement pertains to. So, you know, if this statement is true, um, then if that, then yes, go len go go left. If no, go right, and so on. But also, the actual uh, nodes have a lot more information. So, in this case, um, it's saying in the root node. Um, okay, well, all of the options are equi are equi all of the all the, all of the outcomes for the response are equiprobable, empirically speaking. Why? Because, well, we've got 150 observations, we've got 50 of each species, so they're all equiprobable. Okay? It's giving us a prediction, uh, Satosa. I don't think that means anything. But in any case, and it's using 100% of the data in the original need, uh, root node. Okay, so you can see a lot more information in the node. Then it says, well, look at petal length. Um, if it's less than 2.5, so yes, go left, okay, it creates a new region. In that region, it's got 33% of the data, okay, and calculate the relative frequencies of each of the responses in that region, and it says, well, 100% of them are Satosa, 0% are, and 0% are, are Versicola and Virginica. Okay, cool. If petal length is greater than 2.5, or... Yeah, so this statement 
petal length less than 2.5 is not true. Um, create a new region. In this new region, um, well, it's based on 67% of the original data set. We find that the empirical frequencies um, for those species are 50 and 50%. Okay, so 50-50 uh, probability of, of each. So, vers but it gives a prediction of this color, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, what's nice about this um, and this sort of coloring is not just the additional information, but this this coloring gives you an idea of you know what kind of responses are associated with uh, what predictor values, or I guess what regions in the feature space, right? So we can here see again the sort of order structure is preserved in this tree in that. Uh, low values of petal length um, associated with the response tosa. Um, I guess me uh, larger values of petal length are associated with versicella and virginica. But if you then look at petal width, short petal widths and large petal lengths are associated with versicella, um, and then longer or larger petal widths are associated with virginica. Okay, and within some degree of certainty, because you can look at the relative frequencies of those responses and the amount of data it's based on to make some judgment about how accurate the predictions are in these root nodes. So here we can see some idea, okay, actually this prediction is with some degree of confidence because empirically like 91% of the observations in this region, although it will be just based on 36% of the data, um, are predicted to be versicolor. Okay, so there's a clear relationship here between the predictors and the response, and the predictors are indeed predictive of the response that we're interested in. Again, it's nicely captured in this uh, tree plot. Cool. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a simple tree, so maybe the problem you're working on is not that simple. You might get a much more complex tree, so you might want to be able to control this tree a bit better. Okay, so what you can do is you can go look at the options for R part. R part dot plot. And indeed, what do you see? Um, so R part dot plot. Uh, what you need to pass to it is an R part object, obviously, and then you can tell it what type of plot to draw. Okay, so if you set type equals to zero, it's going to draw a split label at each split and a new uh, a node label at each leaf. If you set it one, label all nodes, not just leaves. If you set it to two, which is the default like one, but draw the split labels below the node labels and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's play around with this and see what types of plots. It. Okay, so the defaults two. Okay, so that's what we had before. What happens if we change this parameter to not? Okay, um, so it takes away the root node. What happens if we make it one? Okay, get that, two. Okay, so it's just drawing the statement at a different place. Let's have a look at that again. Cool, and then zero. Cool. Let's look at three. What other types are there? Okay. Okay, what's cool about three is it's taking that statement, the decision statement, breaking it up in two, and it's writing them on the branches. So it's more clear again, I guess, which direction the truth of that statement applies. So. If petal length is less than 2.5, go left. If it's greater than 2.5, go right, and so on and so forth. Okay, and it's keeping the uh, variable names on the left one. Okay, so that's nice. Um, let's maybe look at type four. Okay, so more similar to what we had before, but it's now putting putting the statements on the branches. Okay. Um, two other parameters that you can go check um, that I find useful. Uh, are fallen leaves and branch. Okay, so let me explain first what fallen leaves are. Fallen leaves, so the way that the, uh, the trees are plotted now, you'll see that all of the uh, root nodes are at the bottom of the plot. Now, I think that's nice because, you know, it, 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 it's immediately obvious where to go look um, for the root nodes. Um, but I guess sometimes that makes a sort of weird tree. Maybe if you're not interested in that, or you don't like that, it doesn't work for you, you can go say fallen.leaves equals uh, false. Okay, and what'll that do? Uh, is that'll sort of lift them up, but you can see also that the branches change, right? So they don't have these elbows associated with elbows. So let's go 
right? So what do I mean by elbows? These sort of elbowing. Right, now I find personally that this sort of works better, right? Because you don't have this additional complexity of an elbow. It, it sounds silly, but like once you have a large tree, um, lots of branches, you don't want to be sort of looking and, you know, along the, the elbows as well. Okay, so that's one thing you can set. And then there's also the branch uh, parameter, which you can set to fractional values to sort of change how the branches are drawn. Um, I guess this is more obvious when you go true, right? So let's go fallen leaves, true. So that's a branching parameter and that sort of controls how elbowy it is in the first place. So if you set it equal to one, very much 0 0.9, 0 0.5, still have some elbows, 0.1, and then you get that. But then fallen leaves are still true. Okay, so let's go fallen leaves equals false. Um, and then set branch equal to one. Then we expect to have these elbow, elbow branches. Okay. So those are, I guess, the some of the more useful um, parameters to change in this tree plot. Others you can go look at. And uh, you can go look at the function PRP because that's called in this function, I believe. Um, Package vignette plotting our parts or package PRP. Yeah, go look at PRP. And th what this will do is this will tell you all of the parameters that you can set. And it is ridiculous. You can change pretty much everything in your tree plot. Uh, you just have to go and look for the, the, the appropriate parameter. Yeah. So, for example, um, you can change the branch colors, the branch line types, the branch types, I guess. Um, there's some tweaking parameter, branch width, branch fill, what color to fill it. So I don't know. Let's let's as example look. Let's take the branch. Um, line type and let's change it to two. See what happens. Okay, yes. And then we get dashed lines for our branches and so on. Cool. So there you can go and check um, what parameters to change to get the desired effect in your tree plot. Okay, cool. So next order of business is we need to draw some uh, or a response curve for this data. Okay, so remember what is a response curve? So in our previous example, well, we had a nice simple one dimensional example where we had one input and a, one response to try and predict. And we were interested in the relationship between the predictor and the response. Okay, so that was simple. So we just go in the input space, which was one dimensional. We create some regularly uh, ordered points. We then calculate a prediction at each one of those regularly spaced points in the feature space. Uh, we draw the corresponding curve and that gives us the mapping between the inputs and the response, right? Okay, so that's nice and easy in one dimension. What is the problem here? Well, the problem here is we've got multiple inputs, right? In fact, we've got four. So let's look at task three and what it, what it requires of us. Okay, so fit a tree using only the petal inputs and plot a response curve. Okay, so let's just look at the data again. Uh, what are our inputs? Sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Okay, so we're only gonna be using the petal inputs. Okay, so I'm being a bit more forgiving. I'm just adding one step to that, or I guess one more dimension. So we're just gonna be looking at a two dimensional um, input space. Okay, so first thing we want to do is fit a new model. Okay, so I'm going to create something called res3. R part, uh, we're going to call model species as a function of petal length um, plus petal width. Right, and what's that going to do? That's going to create a tree object based only on all yeah, based only on those two inputs. Um, I don't know, let's look at oh, r part dot plot. Uh, let's borrow this one. Let's look at the tree plots. Okay, same as before, I guess. <laughs> so indeed, uh, it seems petal length and petal width are most predictive of the response anyway. Cool. So I'm going to leave that out for now. 
So we're going to fit a model only to those inputs. And now we want to draw a response curve. Okay, now how do we draw a response curve with a two dimensional input space? Okay, well, let's think about that. What we want to do is we want to create regularly spaced points in the input space, which is now two dimensional, um, create predictions at each of those points. So we need some coordinates in a two dimensional space. Um, and then we want to somehow interpret the relationship between the, the, the predictors and the response. Okay, so first thing we need to figure out is how to, I don't know, get the coordinates in that input space in some regular fashion. Okay, now the way we're going to do this is we're going to create uh, x, I don't know, dummy, x1 dummy. Now let's make it x1 dummy. Um, dummy sequence running from... Um, the minimum of petal width to the maximum of petal width, so of the observed petal width. And we want to create that sequence. I don't know, we're going to make it length M. And I'm just going to set M, which is going to be some hyperparameter that we can tune for our response curve. Okay, so M is some integer 10, create a dummy sequence. What does that dummy sequence look like? So X1. So this is creating a regular spaced set of points along one of the dimensions of our input space, namely petal width. And it's starting at the lowest petal width, which is 0.1. Um, it's spacing points regularly up to the maximum 2.5. Okay. Now, because we have two inputs that we're interested in, we're gonna create another dummy sequence. So X2 dummy. And it's going to be petal length. Yes. From the minimum of petal length to maximum of petal length. Ugh, what am I doing? Okay, so we've got another dummy sequence. Um, X2 dummy. What does that do? It creates regularly spaced points along the second dimension, which is petal length. Um, it's going 1, 1.65, blah, blah. These are all regularly spaced up to the maximum 6.0. Again, how do we know they're regularly spaced? Well, we've started to create a sequence of length m um, running from the minimum to the maximum, and it, it will space it regularly in this way. You know, believe me, you can take that sequence, any one of those sequence, and you can apply the diff function for difference, and then you should see the same value for all of the differences, first differences. Okay. Cool. So that gives us regularly spaced coordinates along each of the dimensions. But that's not the joint input space, right? We want to look at all of the possible combinations of those coordinates um, to create regularly spaced coordinates in the joint space, so the two-dimensional space. Okay, you see what I'm on about and why we in general call this sort of setting up a lattice um, is to see the following. So I'm just going to create an empty plot now. So I'm just going to plot one as a function of one, that doesn't matter. I'm just going to say type, what type of plot to draw. Uh, type equals n, so draw nothing. And um, what we want to do is we want to set the limits, so x limits, okay, to be the range of petal width. So the first variable and the y limits, comma. We want to set that to be the range of petal length. So what this is going to do is this is going to create an empty plot. Um, I guess let's just say one comma can't model fun yeah can't model an integer as a function of something. So this is just going to create a empty plot region with the appropriate limits. Okay. So if we were to sort of plot our observations, all of them will be visible in this region. If we were to do that. Okay. But what we're actually interested in is seeing, okay, well, how does, you know, creating regularly spaced observations along each dimension um, sort of in, uh, result in a lattice emerging um, and why that might correspond to, you know, the sort of appropriate coordinates. Okay, so what we can do is I'm going to draw some A, B lines. So this is what ab line function is for. I'm going to draw a bunch of horizontal lines um, at the coordinates x2 dummy. Okay, so what is this doing? It's going to this sequence 
x2, it says draw a horizontal line at 1, draw another horizontal line at 1.65, another one at 2, and so on, and so forth. Okay, um, and then I'm just going to go, okay, I'll let me leave it that way. Then create another set of lines, but this time along the vertical, but then use regularly spaced uh, coordinates from the x1 dummy sequence. Okay, so what does that mean? It means right, uh, draw a vertical line passing through 0 0.1, 0 0.366, and so on. Okay, so let's populate that plot region. Okay, so now that we've plotted um, these lines, what does that tell us? Well, we can almost see how this lattice structure emerges, right? Uh, and what this lattice structure is useful for is for identifying the regularly spaced coordinates in this um, two-dimensional uh, plane that we have here. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to create a set of coordinates that correspond to all of the points at which these lines cross, right? And then we'll get our appropriate lattice. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, if we think about it, let's think about the coordinates which lie on this first line over here. Okay, so the y coordinate's always going to be 1. Okay, so we can just repeat the y coordinate how many times? Well, m times, because this sequence uh, uh, of coordinates that we created in the x1 dimension is m long. Okay, so we're going to repeat that first uh, coordinate m times, and then we just record the sequence of x1 coordinates as they are in sequence, right? Then for the next y coordinate, we again repeat that, or x2 coordinate, I guess. Uh, we again repeat that coordinate m times and then record the x1 coordinate as it is in sequence. Okay, so essentially what we can do is we can create the vector or vectors of x coordinates or x1 coordinates and a vector of x2 coordinates which correspond to all these points at which these lines intersect um, by simply repeating all of the elements in these dummy sequences that we created in the appropriate uh, fashion. Okay, so Let's call these capital X1 and capital X2. So these are going to be our dummy X1 and X2 coordinates, which will give us the appropriate lattice. Okay. So for X1, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat X1 dummy just M times. Why do we repeat it M times? Well, X1 dummy is a sequence of values going 0 0.1, 0 0.36, and all the way up to 2.25. How many times is that repeated? Well, there's one sequence, two, three, four, all the way up m times, okay. Also, we want to repeat the x2 dummy sequence. We want to repeat each of its elements how many times? So for this first set of uh, coordinate or points at which these lines intersect, well, just repeat the first one m times, the second one m times, and so on. Okay, so what we use is we use the rep function, which means repeat, and we say take this sequence, repeat each of its elements equals m times. Cool. And those will give us the appropriate coordinates of the points at which all of these lines intersect. If you don't believe me, let's go points, and then we're going to go x2, x1, pch equals 16. I'll fix that error now. And let's see what happens. And indeed, there you go. Those are the coordinates. Cool. So what does that do? Um, well, that creates regularly spaced coordinates in a two-dimensional space. What we want to do now to draw the response curve is evaluate a prediction at each of those coordinates and then hopefully that'll allow us to interpret the relationship between the inputs uh, and the response. Um, cool, but how does that help us, right? So look at these coordinates, um, what can we do with them? Well, we can maybe plot it in a three-dimensional region, we can maybe color the points appropriately, but even if we do that it seems like these points are sort of sparse, right? How are you going to actually interpret a relationship um, between, uh, well, I guess, yeah, uh, a spatial relationship between these coordinates and the response uh, if you have all this sort of white space in between. So remember, the lines aren't really there. We're only interested in the coordinates. Okay. Well, what we can do is we can just incre increase the resolution of this and 
as we start increasing the resolution, this almost discrete lattice um, becomes more and more like a con continuous one. Okay, so let's increase the hyperparameter m uh, to 100. So what this will do is it'll create 100 by 100 coordinates uh, in this two-dimensional space. Okay, so let's do that. And indeed, what do you see? Yeah, sort of very dense lattice. And as we go up, let's make it 200, so 200 by 200. Yeah, okay, almost continuous, right? So these dots are sort of plotting over each other. Even. That's how close they are. Okay, but that's not what we're going to plot. We're not just interested in coordinates. We're interested in creating predictions at those coordinates. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, first thing we need to do is we need to set up a dummy data frame. Okay, so I'm going to call that lat for lattice. Again, set up a data frame, data.frame. Then we need to give this data frame variables um, with these dummy coordinates, uh, but the variable names should be the same as what was used in the model. Otherwise, it's not going to know what to do with it. Okay, so we've got petal width. Um, so data frame petal width equals x1, capital X1, uh, and then petal length, length equals x2. Okay, and that's going to set up the appropriate lattice. That's the data frame. Now what we want to do is we want to pass that data frame to the predict function and apply that predict function to the model fitted. Okay, so let's go create an object called pred for predict. Uh, we're going to call the predict function. Apply the predict function to res3, which was our tree model. Um, and then our new data to which we want to apply predictions uh, is going to be that lattice. Okay. And what type of prediction do we want? We also need to specify that. Well, in this case, we want to have, I believe it's prob for probabilities. Okay, so let's just quickly see if that runs. We've created the predict. Okay, indeed that runs. Okay, so what this is doing is it's creating, um, or it's gonna evaluate a prediction for each of the coordinates in this new lattice that we supplied using model res3. And the type of prediction it's gonna make is it's gonna give us the probabilities um, for each one of these coordinates in this lattice, give us the probability of observing each one of the outcomes of the response. So remember we had three possible outcomes. Um, so let's see what predict looks like. So pred is gonna be a matrix, right? Head, um, and indeed what we see along the columns, we've got the outcomes, possible outcomes for the response. Um, and then within this uh, matrix, we get the probabilities associated with each one of those eight outcomes. Okay, so if we, maybe it's not clear in this one. So for these first couple of observations, it's just like, it's very certain it's Setosa. Okay, so maybe towards the tail, it's different. And indeed, yeah, what we see is, um, yeah, okay, it's, it's still very certain that it's gonna be Virginica, um, but there's still a non-zero probability that it's Versicolor, at least under the predicted model. Okay. Now, how do we do this? How, how do we use this to draw a response curve? Um, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take this lattice, uh, we're going to look at each of these coordinates, and we're going to color code it according to uh, what the prediction is under the model. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to look at this frame of probabilities, this matrix of probabilities, and extract the prediction from that. Okay, one way we can do that, there are other ways. Um, is we can create a object, let's call it CLSS for just the class prediction. Um, and then we're gonna apply, right, to some array. The array we're interested in is predict. Along what margin? Along its rows, we turn which dot max. Okay, so what is this doing? It's saying go along each row in this matrix, okay? tell me which element in that sequence is its maximum. So if you look at row 40,000 here, the maximum in that sequence, that's gonna be this one, right? So return whichever has the max associated probability and that'll give you the class. So this is our decision rule uh, applied to the predicted probabilities from our model. 
okay. And indeed, what you can see is uh, CLSS is going to be a bunch of ones, two, threes, right? Because that so those are the possible indices. So let's maybe look at range CLSS. Yeah, okay, it's running from one to three. Cool. Now what we want to do is I'm going to color code those coordinates according to the predictions. Um, so first we need to create uh, three colors um, with the that can be associated with the res uh, response uh, predictions. So let's create three colors. Um, blue for Satosa. Um, gray. And then purple for Janika. Okay, so we create three colors. Cool. Um, and then we're going to index um, this vector using the class index, and that's going to create an index of the same length as um, the number of coordinates in our lattice. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. Okay. So, first thing we want to do is we want to plot um, x2, x1. Okay, so plot those coordinates, pch equals 16, so we get a nice solid dot. And then what we want to do is color that according to, um, yeah, color that according to calls. Okay, so from this sequence of colors that we created, assign to each coordinate, so remember CLSS, um, this is going to be the class associated with each one of the coordinates in this lattice data frame that we've created. Well, these coordinates come from x1 and x2. Um, so we just need to extract the appropriate classes. Okay, so CLSS. So because CLSS is going to be either 1, 2, or 3 for each one of the observations associated with x1 and x2, um, it's just going to select one of these colors and color it accordingly. Okay, so created the colors, created CLSS. Let's plot that and see what it looks like. And indeed, there we have it. Three regions, one blue, one gray, and then one purple. Okay. Um, and how can we do a quick sanity check? Well, we can just quickly um, superimpose the data on this plot and then see what happens. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, one way to do that is just um, write some text. So write the appropriate class number. So it's going to again be one, two, or three um, at the observed coordinates. Now, this time again, we're looking at iris, dollar, um, sepal, sorry, petal length, uh, iris, dollar, petal width. Now, I'm being deliberate here in writing iris, dollar, so that you know that it's coming from the original data frame. Strictly speaking, I don't have to do that because we were attached. So, in any case, I'm just making it explicit here. Um, and then we can label, oh, sorry, labels. So that's how the text function works. You give it coordinates at which you want to write text, which you can do in formula mode. Um, and then the labels is the actual text that it's going to write there. And the labels we wanted to write is as dot numeric and iris dollar species. Okay, so what is this doing? Well, because iris dollar species, remember the species response is um, encoded as a factor. If you type cast it as numeric, um, it'll assign a numerical value to it. So it'll be one, two, or three. And if we plot the observations, and indeed, there we have it. Okay, so all the class one uh, responses are to the bottom left here, all the class two responses are to this middle gray, uh, middle region here, in the gray region, um, and then all the class three observations are to the top right. Okay, and indeed we can now sort of see that our partitioning algorithm makes sense, right? Because what is x1 and what is x2? Um, well, those are the sort of petal uh, length and petal width variables. So maybe we can make this more explicit by doing it this way. So we can go lattice dollar petal length, lattice petal width. Let's replot everything. 
Okay, and then it changed. Okay, so in our partitioning algorithm, we knew that petal length and petal width was important. Um, so if your petal length is less than 2.5, um, classify as Tosa, which was the first class. If greater than that, well, it's either going to be um, one of the other two classes. Okay, but if it's if you're in this region, so if you have longer petal lengths, then go look at the petal widths and then say, okay, if your petal widths are lo larger than, I think it was 1.7 something, um, classify as uh, Virginica. If less, classify as, as, what was the other one? Setosa, Virginica. Versicolor, sorry. Classify as Versicolor. Okay. And, well, what does this plot tell us? Well, this plot tell us the, tells us the relationship between the inputs and the responses, and more importantly, it does so jointly. Okay, so now, if you then go, go out and you pick a iris flower uh, of one of these three species, uh, you can now take your own measurements, and then you can go to this response curve, and you can say, okay, um, if my response curve is accurate, I can then plot the coordinate there and I can read off from the color of this chart exactly what species it is predicted to be. And then I guess with some degree of certainty which species it is. Why do I say that? Well, um, if it's down below here, we can say that, okay, well, we're pretty confident that it's going to be um, Setosa. If we're to the top right here, we see there is some ambiguity about which class it could be if you're close to this boundary uh, in the in the feature space, this boundary which is given to you by the tree-based partitioning function. Okay, um, so that's that for this one, and I'll see you in the next one.